Our next guest is track and field runner and Olympian Marlena Wesch. In 2012, Marlena became the very first Haitian female to qualify for the semifinals in the 400 meter dash at the Olympic Games held in London. And now she is selling Miami. Marlena is killing the real estate game there and recently took a mini break to go on the show that you probably have heard of called The Bachelor. We got to know this amazing woman with the heart of a champion and I can't wait to know her more. So Marlena, welcome to Out of the Spotlight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Hello, hello. I'm so excited to have you. I am telling you, the second that you know, they introduced you and, and, you know, they do the whole thing. I was like, oh my gosh, she is badass. <laughs> and then obviously we got to know you more during the show and I'm just so excited to have you on. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up and how did you discover your love for running? Oh my gosh. So that, I love this question because there's, so many different moving parts to this. So I grew up, I am born and raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia, um, product of immigrant parents. And so my parents were born and raised in Haiti um, and they moved to the United States when they were in their 20s. Uh, and so growing up, my dad was actually a semi-pro. It, it's called football in the Caribbean and everywhere else except for America. But oh, yeah. <laughs> he was a semi yeah, he was a semi-pro. <laughs> football player and he was a goalie. So of course Ooh. his goal, yeah, his goal was to see me become a soccer player just like he was. And so of course he was my coach, the absolute worst coach I have ever had in my life. Because you know when you have your parents as your coaches, they're literally like just screaming at you because they want you to be the best. They want yeah. so much more for you than probably anybody else. And so, like, actually, I hated being under his, <laughs> I, I hated it, but I was really fast. And so people used to always tell me I ran like a gazelle. And I mean, people don't even know what a gazelle is. I had to actually look it up. I'm like, what the heck is a gazelle? And I'm like, okay, okay, I get You're it. You're like, I get it. It makes sense yeah. now. <laughs> right, right. And so it wasn't until my, what was it, my first year in middle school. So my sixth grade year in middle school, I tried out for the soccer team. And I didn't make it. And I was devastated. I was completely heartbroken. And I ended up just saying like, wow, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was, you know, playing AAU and, and you know, playing just recreational soccer. So my seventh grade year, I was like, well, I don't want to get dismissed again and rejected again. So let me actually try something different. So in seventh grade, I tried out for the track team and I made it. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to take it and literally right. run with it. Literally. Literally. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because it's, it just proves that when one door closes, another one opens. And I am yes. a true believer that everything happens for a reason. And how yes. amazing that that rejection introduced you to your love, your passion, and what yes. would ultimately take you to the Olympics. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So at what point did you realize, you know what, this is more than just a hobby for me. And I see the Olympics somewhere yeah. in there. So in seventh grade, um, and if my coach is listening, correct me if I'm wrong, coach, because I don't remember that was so long ago. <laughs> But in seventh grade, I actually was a 800 meter runner and a 400 meter runner. So I did that double, which as a professional athlete, you'd be like, you're crazy because it's impossible to do nowadays that double. And so, you know, when you're young, it's, you do every, you do every event. And so I ended up actually placing second in the city as my first time ever running track. And I was like, oh, okay, I might actually be kind of good. So then eighth grade year, I ended up kind of going all the way down, like from 800 to the 100. So I ran the 100, the 200, the 400. And I ended up winning the national championship in the 200 meter dash indoors at the Nike uh, Indoor National Championship. Uh, and that's when I knew like, wow, I might actually go kind of far with this. And so I literally had scholarships lined up, um, full scholarships from like 
every track school, every D1 school, um, known to man. And it was kind of the ball was in my court. I can choose whatever school I want to go to. And, you know, that's when I knew like, oh, I'm going to be really good. Oh, and how were your parents, especially dad, how was he feeling knowing that I'm sure at one point he was like, oh man, you know, she's not playing soccer. And at this point when he realized every school wants her. You know, and I think it's so different because see, I have a different story with having immigrant parents that are not even used to this, right? They are not used to going to college. They didn't go to college. My mom actually did end up finishing when she got to the States. She did get her associate's degree, but that's not what they were used to, you know, growing up. And so to actually be able to have a child go to college and then go go to college and, and them not having to pay for it was so new to them. And, you know, they were just kind of like soaking it in. They're like, we have a celebrity <laughs> daughter. Absolutely. We're just going yeah, like, to sit back here. They're having all these home visits. A whole bunch of the college coaches would come to the house and they just be loving it. They just kind of sit up like this, you know, watch it. And you could tell that they were just so proud. And I literally strive to make them proud every single day of my life, you know? And so um, that's, that's literally how that started. And I think my dad really didn't care at that time. It was like, okay, well, she's really good. I don't have to pay for her to go to school. She can get a good education at any school she wanted to do. And, you know, my parents are also very supportive in whatever I choose to do in life. So, I mean, I, I had that backing as well. Oh, I want to meet your parents. (laughs) They sound lovely. (laughs) Um, And just because I love soccer, that's my sport. What, um, what team does, does your dad go for? And and what about you? Do you keep up with? Oh my God. My dad, anything Ronaldo is on any team that he is on, my dad's rooting for his team, you know? And so that's the only time he actually watches football or soccer, whatever you want to call it. And it's, it's always so entertaining because I'm not a big sports watcher. Like I don't like watching sports on TV. Um, Like I, I live in Miami now, so I go to the heat game, but I'm not a huge like fan of watching things on TV. I want to be in it. Like I want to be playing. (laughs) Yeah, it's so competitive. Like, put me in, put me on the tennis court with Venus and Serena. Like, right. I love it. We, you know, I can envision going to a sporting event with you, and all of a sudden we're like, "Where's Marlena? Oh, she's is she is that her? Is she dressing up right now?" Hey, that's so me, exactly. So let's talk Olympics. Once you were eligible to compete, yes. um, you were able to either be part of Team USA or Haiti. And you made a decision. I want you to, you know, explain that part. And how did you choose? I mean, you had two options at that point. Yeah. So by, um, well, by birth, (laughs) I had dual citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. I'm Haitian American. And so I had dual citizenship with Haiti and with the United States. And going into the Olympic year, I knew that I could potentially run for both nations, well, not both, but I I could choose. And I knew, of course, you know, they say the United States is the hardest Olympic team to make, which is very true. Um, And so with that in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, you know, if you actually tried out for this team, you could potentially, and I am such a realist. Um, you know, I'm very confident in my ability, but I'm also realistic in all the goals and just knowing the times of my competitors going in and, and how good that they were, I told myself, okay, you could potentially make the relay team. Like, I don't think you're there yet to actually make the team individually, but you could potentially make the relay team and then potentially get a gold medal because USA four by four, they usually win. Um, and so I was like, or you could risk that not making the team at all, or you can make the team and be an Olympian regardless. And so, I mean, the decision was just, I mean, it was a given, right? Like I'm, do I, do I want to try to potentially make the USA team or do I want to be on a team for sure and be an Olympian for sure? You know? So it was like, okay, why not run for Haiti? And then Haiti is just, you see them on the map for just, just tragic events you know, the earthquake and just, you know, the flood. And it's just everything that you see is just 
negative when it comes to Haiti. And I wanted to be the person that uplifted that country. And, you know, my parents are so proud of where they're from. And I'm proud to be a product of a Haitian American. And so, you know, either way, I was I was proud to be whichever, you know, team I decided to actually be on. So choosing Haiti was a given. <laughs> and I love that you mentioned that because, yeah, you know, they've gone through a lot. And and what I do remember, though, one of the very first times where I, I sort of learned a little bit more about Haiti was when they were in town uh, for a for a football game. And this was a yeah. few years ago when I was working full time in, in, in soccer. But um, mm-hmm. I remember just how passionate yeah. they they were, how good they were, how quick. And mm-hmm. When you told your parents the news and you told them, hey, guess what? Team Haiti, Olympics, here yeah. I come. Um, <laughs> how, how was that? You know, they were so excited. And it's so funny because now they're on social media, which is oh. absolutely <laughs> hilarious. So all they do is brag. And they're just like posting these pictures oh. and my daughter, this. And they That's just so love cute. bragging. And you can tell that they're just so proud, you know? Yeah. And so they were just, in, in all actuality, I honestly feel like they just need to be influencers. <laughs> Um, because they're just so great at like marketing me. I need to get their handles after this so I can follow them. But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about the Olympic experience. Yes. You know, that's, I would say, every athlete's dream. And once you got the news and once you realized, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going – yeah. What was that like? How did you prepare? Did you have any rituals? Uh, <laughs> so it's so funny because it doesn't hit you. And I think I could speak for quite a few athletes. It really doesn't hit you until the opening ceremony. Hmm. You know, you really don't realize like, oh my gosh, I'm going to the Olympics until you're actually there at the opening ceremony with your flag, with, you know, with your country's name across your chest. And you're like, wow, I'm literally at the Olympics. And I think that's really when it hit me too. Because when I actually hit the A standard um, at one of the track meets that I went to, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I hit the A standard, I'm going to be going. It was just more so more more so happy that I ran that fast time and not really putting the two and two together saying, okay, I ran that fast time that also qualified me for the Olympic Games. And so in preparation for it, it was just a lot of meets, a lot more meets to kind of get my body acclimated, um, getting myself prepared for the time change in London, um, just kind of like sleeping differently, sleeping earlier, um, you know, and just kind of preparing myself for London in itself. And then luckily when you get there, I don't, I, you know, I have like a whole week prior to actually even competition. So still had some time to adjust um, rituals. I just kind of maintained my focus, staying hydrated and, and trying to pretend like it was just any other meat. Although of course, this is the biggest stage in all athletes careers. I was talking to my, my sister-in-law yesterday, uh, Courtney, and I mean, she loves you too. And I've completely forgot that she used to run. She's from South Africa and she did track and field there. Um, and I told her, I was like, Hey, I'm chatting with Marlene and Morrow. She goes, Oh my gosh, ask her, you know, post-race meal and just how she, she's really, you know, she's really into that. So I was like, okay, I'll throw that in there. But I, I was driving when I was talking to her. So as I'm driving, I'm like, man, but that is a good point, you know, because that's, mm-hmm. that's your fuel. So uh, besides a ritual, kind of how did you uh, prepare for that? And yeah, after a race, what is your post-race meal? Well, I want a Big Mac from like McDonald's. That's really what I want, right? But I don't get that. <laughs> so post-race, especially if I know, so I made it to the semifinals. So after the prelims, which the funny, I have like the funniest story of, I don't know if you're going to ask this question later on, but the funniest story is my parents didn't expect me to make it past the prelim. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so they had only bought tickets <laughs> for the prelims. <laughs> oh, <And so. laughs> And so when I actually made it to the semifinal, they're like, holy crap, oh. like, we were not expecting you to make it that far. And I was like, I love that they're so honest. <laughs> 
And so, you know, everything changes because you're yeah. shocked, like, oh my God, I'm going to the next round. Like, you know, and so it actually gives you some anxiety. You know, I had anxiety. I was like, okay. And then you start switching things up and doing things differently because you're just so nervous because you didn't expect yourself to make it that far, you know? And so what I actually ate was, you know, pasta. Pasta has a lot of carbs. It's a lot of fuel. Um, it is pretty heavy, but depending on when you eat, you know, and, and my competition was, I think I ran really, really, or my prelim was really early in the morning. I want to say it was about 9, 10 a.m. in the morning. So, of course, I was able to eat pasta at noon or, you know, 1, 2 o'clock uh, to where I was okay the next day. Uh, and the semifinals was in the evening. So the semifinals was probably at 5, 6 o'clock p.m., and so, you know, I, I had time to recover from eating such a big, big meal. People have different, um, I guess, definitions for it. But what is something about running that just makes you just feel like yourself? Well, if you haven't heard, I actually hate running. <laughs> Shut up. I did not know that. <laughs> You're kidding me. I actually hate it. I You are hate awesome. It. <laughs> Oh, just, I didn't think it could get any better. What? <laughs> soccer, soccer is my love. Soccer oh. is actually my love. And it literally hurt me to my core when I didn't make that team, but I didn't want to continue failing. And then I just ran track because everyone said I was fast. You know, it wasn't because I like really wanted to run track, but it's so funny how it all played out. Um, I can say I love competing. Like I'm competitive just in general. So anything that I do is always going to be a competition. I'm always going to want to win. And, and so when I was good, when I, when I started getting really good and I started winning, it just became, all right, win again, win more, keep going. And so that was really what catapulted my career and kept me on the path to running track. <laughs> oh, but wow. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. Like, I, I have no regrets right now. I, I'm retired. Yeah, I'm yeah, happy yeah. to be retired. But of course, when the Olympics comes back and you watch the track, you're just like, oh my God, I wish I was out there. You feel like, that rush. I really wish. Heck yeah, I'm like, oh man, I would have I done so good if I was last leg on that four by four. <laughs> you know, and you start thinking about, you start yeah. you know, reminiscing. Yeah. And um, I mean, do you do you currently run? Do you oh, yeah. make yourself run? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's so funny. Um, I actually had tweeted. I was like, why do people like running? This is the absolute worst, worst event ever. I love and that this is coming from the Olympian. Just want to, yeah. just want to say that. <laughs> right? and I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And I was a sprinter. I was a short sprinter. So I only ran 400 meters, you know? And so everyone's like, well, why don't you like running? I was like, just because runners actually run distance. Like they do miles. And my coach would literally punish us with miles. That was our punishment. Like, okay, we're doing four miles today. And you're like, huh? <laughs> like, why do you hate me? And so like on our recovery days, we do like a 30 minute jog, but mm -hmm. 30 minute jog is essentially three miles. And so running three miles was not fun at all. Yeah. And so we used, we used to hate recovery days because it's like, what am I going to do for three? What, where do you go? Like, <laughs> what do you do for three miles? But now I actually do run. So I still work out just because I always told myself I did not want to be that track athlete that let myself go, um, you know, and just, you know, gained a lot of weight and just kind of just decided not to keep up my physique and keep up, you know, my, my health. Yeah. And so I actually do run miles now. <laughs> I, I hate it, but I see the benefit, you know, yeah. and, and I know that this is the only way, like you want to still look like you ran track, you know, and I love when people ask me, Oh my gosh, do you run track? And I'm like, I haven't ran track in like six years, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. But yeah. Thanks. <laughs> And right. do you do you play soccer at all for fun or not at all? I have not. <sighs> we got to bring you out in a long time out of retirement. I know. I, Wait, I know. What position did you did you play? I was left mid because I have a left foot. So oh, I was yes. Ooh. I have a left foot and I'm right. That's a gift. So yeah. So everyone's like, so you're ambidextrous, and I'm like, isn't that when you're both handed? Yeah. I'm like I'm not <laughs> ambidextrous, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> and and let's talk a little bit about opening ceremony where it all hits you. Um, obviously, there's so much pressure, and I would maybe use the word stress. I mean, as well as excitement, but. How were you able to take care of your mental health and kind of keep yourself composed? Yeah, I think that's a great question. First of all, because I think the, um, what's the word I want to use? The, right now in today's society, mental health is such a huge priority. And it was, it's a lot bigger of a priority than it was back in 2012. So Absolutely. I don't think social media was as Big. I mean, you see, you had Facebook and everything, and Instagram was just coming into form. I, I think I created an Instagram for the Olympics. That's how back in the day it was. <laughs> and um, so it, it wasn't as huge as it is now, where people are literally just like drained with just being on social media all day and kind of seeing and comparing their lives. It wasn't like that in 2012. So for me, it was just all about focusing on running my race. And that's all I cared about. You know, I, I wasn't, I, I don't even know how I would have handled it in today's society. With oh gosh. Yeah. Like, I would have had to delete. Yeah. I would have had to delete my, the app on my phone and just really focus because once you get a hold of what people have been saying and what people do say, and, and the crazy thing about it, one of the biggest things that was said about me prior to even running was oh my gosh, we have all these people. Cause I think there was probably about four or five of us that actually ran and represented Haiti at the games, myself and my teammates. And we were all Haitian American. So we were born in the States and they were all saying all the Haitian, the Haitian community was basically saying like, these aren't real Haitians. Like, are you kidding? Aww. Like, why, how dare they try to run and represent us? And that to me was mind blowing. Cause it's yeah. like, we are actually trying to represent and, and uplift this community. And all you can think about is where we were born, you know, yeah. and it was mind blowing. Yeah, no. And that's such a, an important topic that you mentioned with social media. I feel like I have such a love hate relationship <laughs> with yes. it. I mean, it's good for things like this. I mean, how amazing is it? We're chatting and we're right. going to get to share your story with others, but obviously, yeah, there's that, that ugly side to it where, right. you know, there are days where I, I do tell myself, don't look at anything, just mm -hmm. kind of focus on yourself, your work. And mm -hmm. I will be very honest. I feel for the younger kiddos, you know, the, the 14 year olds, the 13 year olds where, I mean, there was this meme I saw where it was like a picture of a 13 year old all dolled up and yeah. it said, but this was me at 13. It was a little girl with like a hello kitty design all over yeah. her face. I'm like, right. yeah, I I'm so thankful that, you know, we did get to enjoy that, that childhood innocence right. perhaps. But I am a little pre phones, right? Pre yeah, pre phone. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, with that, I guess how now you know present time. Now that obviously social media is huge. Oh my gosh. You, you're in the public eye. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do feel like people are harsh, you know, yes. and and it's so easy to get misunderstood as well. Yes. Especially, I mean, I compare it to me texting you, for example, me saying hey, we still on for the interview and maybe I don't sound excited and you might be yeah. like, oh my gosh, does she not want to do the interview? And I feel right. like social media does that too. And it's so hard. Yes. It's so hard. Yes. So how do you kind of uh, maintain yourself composed and just yeah. try to tune everything out? How do you do that? Right. And thank you for asking this question, because I think it's so important, you know, especially people that are either coming up or kind of getting into the spotlight or limelight for whatever yeah. profession that they're doing right now. And for me, it's you can't read the con. And I think I learned this from, you know, fellow bachelor alums is you can't read the comments, you know, because everyone's going to have an opinion even if you were the nicest person <laughs> on the entire show, someone's yeah. going to take that and say, why, the heck why are you so, so nice? nice. <laughs> yeah. Like it was yeah. a competition. Like yeah. you wanted to grow some balls yeah. or something. Yeah, and you're just absolutely. Like, are you kidding? And then understanding for me is I will never please everybody. 
So if my goal is to have the mindset to where I'm going to be the nicest person, the most respectful person, just so I can potentially please all of America, all of the world, I will literally drag myself to the ground with that mindset. You know, so going in, I knew I was going to be loved and I was going to be hated. There were going to be people that really rooted for me and there were going to be people that basically were waiting for my downfall. And I go into that and I go into life every single morning I wake up knowing that. And that's, I'm, a, I'm able to protect my peace knowing that. And we'll be right back with some rapid fire questions. Awesome. Okay, so... We have a little rapid fire session, <laughs> rapid fire. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think I'm calling it, oh, well, as of last week, it's officially called Stuff It Up. That's okay. the name. I love Kinda that. I love up. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do this. All right. First question, what do you do to unwind? Drink wine. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like how you, th- you answer that quickly. <laughs> I'm like, is it rapid? Am I, am I rapid? No, I love answering? that. That's perfect. Um, night in or night out? Oh, night, night out all the time. Oh, night all day. <laughs> really? I yes. love that. I love that. So, um, I guess I'm going to ask you this just because you said night out. Um, skinny jeans, are they still in or no longer cool? I don't even wear jeans. I'm okay. I'm a dress person That's how I am. because it's easy. I put it yeah. on and I just leave. I don't yeah. Jeans are... <laughs> Jeans. I, mean, I do wear jeans every now and again because I have some bell bottom jeans that I really love. Ooh. I've not worn skinny jeans in a long time. Me neither, but I just heard something the other day and apparently it's not cool anymore. So <laughs> I guess it right. won't be. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Favorite country to visit and why? Ooh, Morocco. <gasps> Morocco was gorgeous. The colors, beautiful. It was just so many colors. And you go to like the the market and they have uh, they have everything in so many different colors and it was just such a vibrant place and i rode a camel which <gasps> is extremely high uh, i wish people would understand how high their their humpbacks are <laughs> it's like six feet in the air no right? way so you fall off but you fall off a camel you're you're probably you're gonna done something, literally yes so morocco is my hands down Favorite place. I'm five one, five two, so I will not be oh. getting on a camel <laughs> anytime Please soon. Don't. Please. No. <laughs> Unless I'm like wearing wedges or <laughs> big old spice girl right. shoes. Yeah, no. <laughs> um country that you want to visit. Ooh, ooh, good question. I wanna go to I wanna go to Australia. <gasps> Me too. Yeah, like I really I mean that flight, golly, that's like a two-day flight, yeah. but I've always <laughs> wanted to go there. That would be fun. I want to do yeah. that or, or Greece. I think that would be I fun. do want to do Greece, but Greece. I told myself, there's some countries that I would only go to with a significant other, and I'm not there right now. Oh, so is that your romantic even. one? Yes. Greece, yeah. Greece is my romantic one, yes. I like that. Okay, so I know you made a lot of uh, new friends on the show, Yes, but... If you were left on a deserted island, which three girls from the show, The Bachelor, Uh would you want there with you, next to you? Yes. And why? Oh, my gosh. Okay, Susie. (laughs) Susie, for sure. She was my best friend on the show. Absolutely loved her. Loved her so much about everything. Um, Just because I just love her so much. That's why I would bring Susie. Gabby, because Gabby's going to make me freaking laugh, right? I'm going to forget that I'm on a deserted island because she's going to have me dying laughing the entire time. And Love her uh, too. Oh, good question. Who else? Who else? Who else? Um, I'm going to say... I'm going to say Sierra as well. I like her too. <laughs> she's awesome. Okay, why? Why? Sierra, Sierra is, she will talk you, she'll talk your head off, you know, <laughs> but at least I know I'm always going to have some entertainment because Sierra is entertaining and she says what she says. She doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't hold her breath. She doesn't care what she says. And I just, I love Sierra. She's hilarious as well. Okay, so after your answers, I'm like, maybe. We should pitch the show. I mean, seeing all four of you, (laughs) Deserted Island, I would absolutely watch. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
Oh, I love that. Um, and speaking of things to watch, I saw a tweet and you said something about wanting to meet with Tyler Perry because you had a movie idea. <laughs> Yes, Is yes. It a comedy? Yes. Like I love it already. It's it's definitely it's it's basically about narcissism. <laughs> like I Ooh. I would make a movie about my last relationship and it would be the best movie ever because no one would ever believe that it was based on a true story. <laughs> Um, I want to pitch it to Tyler Perry so bad because just knowing his movies and how yeah. dramatic they are, right? I would, I would, I would do amazing. Like, can someone please Tyler Perry? Let's call me now. <laughs> Tyler Perry, please. She'll give you a rose after you accept yes, the movie will. proposal. Please, please. <laughs> All proceeds can go to you. I'm kidding. Don't quote me on that because it won't. <laughs> like, we'll edit that out. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm already a fan of this movie. I was already, <laughs> I was already thinking it will be a comedy, but no, I will. Narcissist, yeah. People need yeah. to learn more about what that word means. They do. They I truly really do, do think that. They really do. Yeah. Let's go back a little bit to to the Olympics um, around that time. What is something that you learned about yourself? Oh my gosh. Um... Great question. I learned that. That's a good question. I learned that I am, I'm dependent on feedback, you know, and, and more so constructive criticism, right? And especially in the Olympics, I didn't have my coach with me because um, my coach was my college coach, you know, and he didn't go with me to the Olympics. Um, and so I was on FaceTime with him and it was so hard to train and not have him literally next to me saying, no, you need to go faster, go harder here. All right. Make sure you, you speed it up. Even though we had constantly trained and done this exact same routine and just regular track meets, this was the biggest meet of my life yeah. and not being able to have that feedback at practice and say, all right, I'm going to need you to hit it at 200 meters and just go all out. He vocalized that in the FaceTime that we had, but it's not the same. I needed to see him. It mm -hmm. was not the same. Yeah. You know? And so I knew, and that's one thing that I did learn, although I kind of knew that, like there was my first track meet without my coach. So I recognize that, look, I need someone here. I need that. I'm dependent on that feedback or I won't perform to the best of my ability. Would you say that's kind of like you need a kind of like a, a kick in the butt, like that push? Yes. I'm like yes. that. Yes, 100%. And my coach, and I, I tell everybody this, like Coach Johnson, shout out to you. Oh. You know, he was literally Coach Carter. And he was, I'm, I'm all for constructive criticism. Right? Oh, me too. And he was one of the ones where I was like, you're not going hard enough. Pick it up. Why are you running so slow? And he would literally, he would get one of the other girls on the track team to be like, you know, my rabbit sometimes when I was doing a really, really hard rep. Mm -hmm. And he would, he would basically say that this is your competitor. So he would name my competitor and say, oh. pretend this is so-and-so don't let her beat you. Don't let her beat you. And of course, like he really trained my mind and I, I was dependent on him. And so, you know, till this day, you know, he's literally the person that is able to transform your mentality. And I think that's so huge, especially in today's society to be able to train your mind so that you are you are strong. And how amazing that you got such a good coach at that yes. time, right when you needed it. Not everyone gets right. that. So that's right, huge. Exactly. I love that. Exactly. And what would you say is some of the best advice that you've received? Man, so the best advice, especially from him that I've received is you have to always look out for you because no one else is looking out for you like you are. And, you know, he taught me that you have to trust yourself and you are as strong as you are mentally. So if you don't think you can do it, you won't do it. Yeah. The moment that you start doubting yourself is the, is the moment that you've given up and you failed yourself. Um, and so he always taught me to believe in yourself no matter how big your goal is, no matter how small your goal is, no matter how impossible it seems like it's going to be. If you believe that you can do it, 
you will achieve it. Oh, I love that. You've had <laughs> a, a, amazing people in your life. I, I mean, I from have. him to your parents, that's yes. such a blessing. And uh, your brother, he competed, right, as well? He did. In the Olympics? He did. <gasps> what so was that he like? Actually, it's so funny. He actually tried out for the United States team. No way. <laughs> when, when, I, when I competed for Haiti, he tried out for the U.S. team, and he didn't make it, which was no shocker. Um, he didn't make it, and I'm sitting here, you know, running the Olympics because at the end of the day, what I had to, what I had to be cognizant of and, and remind myself of is an Olympian is an Olympian is an Olympian. Yes, it doesn't matter which name is across your chest. If you have, you know, Africa across your chest versus the United States of America, you're not any less than the next. I Olympian. agree. And, and so that's one thing I had to tell myself, like if I ran for United States, I wouldn't be any better of an Olympian than the, the person running for Spain or Portugal or, or Haiti, you know? And, and so that was that to me, you know, that was important. And my brother was just like, no, U.S. is where I live. And it's a lot more exposure on the United States team, of course. But, you know, if the end goal is to be an Olympian, be an Olympian. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. It goes back to what you mentioned that no matter who or what country or team is on your jersey, I mean, you're you've made it that far. Right. And that's such a powerful thing. I agree. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so now let's talk real estate. I yes. love <laughs> that you are doing this because I mean, just seeing you and your personality, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is why you're killing the game there. But <laughs> how did you get started? Oh my goodness. So I actually got my license, well, in just real estate in general, we'll talk about that. My parents own properties. And so they own property in Virginia and Atlanta. And now actually we're under contract and we're about to close on a house for them here in Florida. Oh, so, congrats. Yeah. yeah. So I'm really happy for them. And of course I'm their real estate agent. So that was even more fun, <laughs> um, but stressful in itself because trying to please your parents oh, and also yeah. be professional is very hard. Um, but, you know, I, I watched, I grew up watching them, you know, I grew up watching them struggle to be in this foreign country and then become successful. And it was just always something that I looked up to. And so watching them own all these properties and, you know, make money, just passive income from owning properties. I'm like, okay, well, I can, I should be able to do this too. You know, and I'm like, I'm not married or in a relationship or anything like that, but I think I could do this myself. And so I bought my first property when I was 27 and um, I bought my second property when I was 28. And Look so at like, you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, well, let me just keep on buying properties. And I got introduced to the Airbnb world. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love hosting. I'm a super host. So I have a property in Gainesville that is on Airbnb, uh, doing really well, making me a lot of money. And I, that was my introduction to real estate. And at the time I didn't have my license. And so also um, my background career is in human resources. So I help people, I talk to people. And so with real estate, it's kind of putting people in that end game goal, which is to own a house, right? Is to own something and some huge asset. Um, and so for me, getting my real estate license was a no brainer. You know, so I got my real estate license and, and now I get to help individuals own their first, if not, well, if not their first, you know, real huge asset. And I love that, right? Because you're transforming people's credit. You're helping them transform their credit so that they're able to purchase this property because that's what it boils down to. For me, a lot of my friends, they're unable to buy a house because of their credit scores. And I think in today's society, especially with social media, it's all about keeping up the Joneses, right? Like, I want to look really good in this photo. So let me rock this Louis Vuitton, this Gucci. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's a more emphasis on looking the part instead of actually having your own, you know? And so I definitely wanted to be someone that was a sounding board for my friends owning and my friends actually investing in themselves. 
I interviewed Guy Tory last week and um, he's a comedian actor. He has like his own documentary on Prime Video. It's so cool. But he said the same thing that you just yes. said, that people right. want to just show things off before the end product, before putting in the work. So that's, that's so crazy. They all said the same thing. Um, <laughs> what's something that people would be surprised to learn about when it comes to real estate? I think what people don't think about, and I, especially in today's market right now, everyone's thinking, oh my gosh, it's too hot of a market. I am just, this is not the time. Let me wait. Mm -hmm. wait. And what they don't understand is that waiting could be detrimental, right? This is the lowest that we've ever seen interest rates and they're climbing. Yeah. So they just went up, you know, and they're going to keep going up because now we're looking at inflation. The only way to control inflation is to control interest rates. And a lot of people have this misconception, especially because like I'm a millennial and it's kind of hard to talk to other millennials about the importance of this because we don't understand it, you know? And so I have friends that are like, I'm just going to wait it out. The market's really too hot right now. I can't find anything. Everything I find, someone's offering cash and I'm just not able to beat anybody. So I'm just going to wait, right? And you're looking at it from a perspective of if you wait too long, interest rates by the end of this year, we could see them at 6%, right? Which means you're buying, you're buying at such a high interest rate and the house that you could have got today for $400,000 at the end of this year. I mean, I don't know what, what a good house costs to anybody's pockets right now, but you know, it could, that same exact house is going to cost you a lot more right? And in, in the future. So right now is the time to buy. Right now is the time to invest. And I think that for me, I just want people to understand that educate yourself, you know, and understand the market because it's the most important thing that you'll need to know when going into purchasing a, a home or a huge asset like that. And if someone is getting started, they're thinking about, let's say, purchasing their first property, okay. what would you say is the best advice that you can give them or maybe the first thing that they should do like step number one just to get you know that push so step number one it depends on is this your home or is this an investment property because if it's an investment property is it going to bring you a return you know is it going to make you money because that's why people get investments right because they want that return uh, they want that roi and for someone that's just a, a homeowner and wants to buy their first house it's one, what can you afford, right? Because the, the biggest thing is, what's your credit score? Like, can you actually even get a house? Can you get approved for a loan? Or do you have cash? Because right now, cash is king. What we're seeing is a lot of people from New York or the northern parts of the states are coming down in droves. Well, this is what I'm seeing in Florida. They're coming down in droves in Florida and they're purchasing all the houses cash. You know, so it's very, very competitive. Partner with a, a real estate agent that knows exactly what the heck they're talking about, because that's also important. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so Huge. one, your first step is going to be get pre-approved, get pre-approved, talk to a lender, see what you're pre-approved for before you go on Zillow and start shopping for $1 million properties because yeah. you think you can afford a $10,000 a month house, right? Yeah. That's not what it's about. Get right. Approved. Let the bank tell you what you can afford based on your debt to income ratio. You are so good and so passionate. I'm telling you, <laughs> if I ever go buy something there, if I move, I'm coming to you. <laughs> Thank you. Please do. <laughs> I love that. So anyone listening, if you're in Miami <laughs> or, Florida buy, in or Florida, yeah, I love yes. that. Um, okay. So now we got to talk love. Love, love. <laughs> Gosh, I'm like, I wish I had a single brother <laughs> so I could introduce y'all. I'm like, I would love to have you in my family, but I don't. Thank uh, you. <laughs> so, of course, you know, with that comes The Bachelor. And yes. at what point did you decide to go on the show? Like, was it you was it a friend was it your awesome parents like how did oh that happen <laughs> they didn't even know what the bachelor was you know and and so actually i had got out of a 
very toxic relationship and it completely broke me. Um, he was a narcissist and it literally broke my entire spirit. And everyone that I talked to is always like, Oh my God, you're just so confident. You're just such a strong woman. And I wish I had your confidence. And I'm like, well, you only, if only you knew the half, right? I was not always like this. And it literally completely shattered me to the point where I actually gave up on the thought of me ever being with someone honest, trustworthy, and loyal. And um, so I said, I, I had to take a step back and, and, and reflect and ask myself, okay, is it me? Is, is, is it me that continues to attract men that don't want to be honest in the relationship, don't want to be you know, loyal in the relationship and don't want to be faithful? And, and so in my reflection, I, I told myself, well, why don't you try to angle love in an unconventional way? Hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, let me try the best. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I Super love unconventional. That. And so I applied, just not even, I just applied like on a whim. I, I was not expecting anything. I wasn't holding my breath. I just said, well, let me try love this way. Right. I applied for it and literally a month later someone called me and I was like, Oh, oh. Wow, this is this is real. <laughs> like, okay, let's let's go, you know? <laughs> Oh, that's so awesome. Well, first things first, I'm so proud of you for putting yourself you. out there. I mean, narcissist, dating dating those type uh the worst. Like the last yes. I guess relationship I had, it was literally that's when I learned the definition of what a narcissist same. is. Yeah. Same here. Same yeah. here. I, yeah. I had no idea that, and you just, you have no idea that people could be like that. Yeah. Right. Like I give, I give so many people the benefit of the doubt and I give so many people grace. And I always think people are good people under whatever shell that they're under. Even people that are deemed bad by society. I'm, I'm like, there's, there's something good about this person. Like, you know, you guys just don't know them enough or, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm always giving people the benefit of the doubt, but this, I was like, oh no, this is deeply rooted. Yep. This is who they are. Yep. And they don't want to change. Is, they don't, they don't care to change because nope. they get what they want. Yep. It, they don't care. Yeah. Okay. So back to the bachelor. So when you got the call and you were like, yeah, I'm going to go, uh, were you excited? Were you nervous? I mean, I was how so... was the packing? <laughs> I've it always was... told myself the packing must be the surreal part. Right. Yes, it was such an, a crazy experience just because I had to make the decision on whether or not I wanted to do it for one. And with that came potentially quitting my job. Ooh. You know, I was the vice president of human resources at a huge company in Gainesville. I was making six figures. I was making a lot of money at, you know, such a young age. I was very successful and to leave it all behind and literally like give it all up to try to find love. Right. Yeah. And then such a small percent chance at finding love amongst 30 women and one person, you know? And so I had to really do a lot of kind of soul searching and ask myself, is this something that you want to do? You know? And I think for me, I am such a structured person. So mm -hmm. giving up my income <laughs> yeah. and, and giving up like the livelihood, I lived in Gainesville. So it wasn't like that. I, I wasn't Miami, you know, like I, I was balling out of control, you know, going, out the country, you know, once every three months, you know, and it, it was just, that was my lifestyle. Like I loved traveling and I'm thinking, okay, I might have to give this up if I go on this show because I won't have that same money coming in to be able to do these things that I wanted to do or do these things that I love doing. And so for me, I was excited that for me, it was the funny thing, the funny thing about it, being a competitor and being an athlete, more so excited that I was chosen, right? Mm. Like, I yeah. Chosen Out of everyone this. that applied. Yes. Yeah. That was the exciting part about it. And then, and then you, you come to the realization that, okay, but I'm going to be giving a lot for this, you know? And I started to really think about it and no one knew, we didn't know who the bachelor was going to be. A gamble. A gamble. A yeah. gamble at love. Yeah. And so I made the decision and I made the decision for one Yes, to find love because I know that this person, the bachelor, was going to be someone that's actually looking for love, right? Versus my past and my my past relationships where they weren't really looking for love. 
Let's, let's be honest, you know? And so it's like, okay, well, I have this chance. It's a very small percentage that I actually end up with this person, but this person actually does want a wife, you know? So I was like, that weighs more than, than just dating out here and hoping that the person you end up with is someone that actually wants to be married. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. And then on top of that, I wanted to get out of Gainesville so bad. It, it was, it was like a dead end for me. I was very successful, but what else? Like this isn't like, I wasn't born to wake up and go to corporate America, clock in, clock out, leave at five, go home, eat dinner, do it all. Like, I was Repeat. Not, yeah. That's yeah. not my personality. That's not who I am. And so I knew I wanted more for myself. So that was also what, what my, what confirmed and solidified my reasoning for going. Oh, I like that. I like that you thought about it yeah. because I'm like that. Yeah. From that full experience, what's something that I asked you this for, for the Olympics and competing, but from the show and after that full experience, what's something that you ultimately learned about yourself? Man, I am not as confident around a lot of pretty women. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, and anyone I, who yes. says that they are, I mean, I don't think that's true. And I say that with the most utmost respect because those women are all amazing, all gorgeous. And just being in a being in an environment where everyone is gorgeous and you actually find out so much about yourself. You know, I found out that, hey, like I am not as confident <laughs> as I really think that I am, right? When it comes to these situations where it just breathes stress and pressure and the pressure to just try to be amazing because I mean, beauty was beauty was something everybody had. So what what is my differentiating factor, right? And what differentiates me from the rest of women? And it was one, of course, being Olympian. So of I used that and I leveraged that. I yeah. used that to my, you know, because I'm like, okay, well, these girls are all pretty. So I cannot be anybody in, in the beauty aspect of it. But the physical aspect, I got this. <laughs> I'm telling you, I... I mentioned this earlier. I knew I liked you the second they did your introduction, <laughs> but that one episode where y'all are playing football, American football, I think that was in Houston. Wait a minute. Yes, it was. Well, yeah, it was NRG. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that episode. I'm, I kid you not. I rarely like rewind, but I had to like that. <laughs> there was that confessional where it was just you and you were pumped. You were, <laughs> you were like, you were, yeah, you were pumped. And I loved seeing that. And I was cracking up. I was laughing. Yes. I was cheering. I literally <laughs> felt like I was truthfully watching a sporting event. And I'm like, why the heck did the Texans not give you a rose and say, you better stay. Houston needs oh, no. you because they do. <laughs> Houston, you guys have a problem. And it's, you know, you guys not choosing me on your team. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. That was brilliant. That was great. And that's something I love too. It's just one of the reasons why I love sports is you can see the passion right there yes. in front of you, you know? And, and I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have passions with, with what they do, but if you're a doctor, you can't really say, Hey, so I'm diagnosing you with this and I love my job, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but with an athlete and you, I was just like, Oh man, she just loves competing. She loves to win. And yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that was, you. that was a lot of fun. That was cool. <laughs> Um, and what would you say is more nerve wracking the night before a race or the night before a row ceremony? Oh my gosh. Row ceremony, hands down, hands <laughs> down. The row ceremony is the most nerve wracking thing ever. Because one thing I love to compare it to is for one, you're in a boat that no one understands, but the people in the bubble with you. Yeah. Right? And so yeah. everything's paid for, you know, and you're just like living this fantasy world. You're, you're in a fantasy world, honestly. You know, it's like, I tell people it's like being in the matrix. You're in this world that no one understands, but you. And to ultimately eventually leave it, you're back in the real world to where you got to pay for things. You got to worry about actually having a job. You got to actually worry about making money. It's scary. It is scary. And so every single day you're just trying, you're fighting 
You're fighting for the next opportunity to stay longer. You're fighting for the next opportunity at actually getting time so he could actually see your value. He could see, you know, who you really are. And if you don't get that time with him, then you feel as if it's a lost cause because he never, you know, he never gets a chance to see who you really are. And yeah, yeah it was so much more nerve-wracking than, than a race. So <laughs> I bet see for me when there's something coming up the next day, I, yeah, I either I get little sleep or I'm just over preparing or thinking about it. So I can only imagine how all of you ladies feel before such an important night like that. Um, but that's so cool. I'm proud of you for, for putting yourself out there. And like I mentioned earlier, it's so cool because we got to see more of you. We got to learn more about you and we got to see you run. Those girls didn't Thank know what, you. yeah, what they had coming. That was, that was brilliant. That was cool. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, um, wait, last question. So would you say you girls see more of each other than you see the actual bachelor? You do. Yes. Right. You do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that's why, why I, I mean, I don't know how, how much you watch the show, but whenever it's done, that's why all the girls are so close. Like they do everything together. It's literally a huge sorority. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we love each other so much because we went through that together. And we got through it together. We cried together. We laughed together. You know, we embraced each other and we uplifted each other. And in those moments and that that length of time that we were there with one another, we learned so much about each other and we bonded in such a deep way that people would never understand unless they're actually in there as well. And um, I think that's, that was the most important part. Yeah. It, you know, and, and, and we spend more time with each other than we did with the lead, you know, with Clayton. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think that, um, that hits a point of you also shared almost the same emotions of yes. love, excitement, heartbreak right. or whatever it right. was. So that's, that's right. Pretty, that's pretty cool. Well, um, this has been fun. You are yes. amazing. <laughs> um, any upcoming projects or anything that you can talk about right now? Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Oh my gosh. I think I know what that means. I'm not going to, I'm not going to egg you on. So, okay. Well, if it is what I think it means, hold on, let me freak out off camera. (laughs) Okay, cool. (laughs) I'm done with that. (laughs) No, I'm so excited. You are beautiful inside and out. I stick to, you know, I wish I had a single brother because you're going to (laughs) make someone so happy and you're going to make a family so happy. And, yes. um, yeah, I'm so proud of you. Um, you're a, an amazing woman from Olympics to real estate business woman and, you know, not being scared to find love. I mean, yes. it's all about putting yourself out there and I think more people yes. need to need to do that. So I'm sure you're an inspiration to, to many. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I love this interview. It was so much fun. Yeah, I know. This was a blast. So organized too. I love how we started out and ended. That was great. Oh, thank you. It's the vibe. Yeah. You know, and then it's also the vibe and the energy, you know, I think you get so much more out of it when the energy is also there. So thank you for your energy. Oh, no, thank you so much. I feel like I've, I've made a new friend. So whenever I yes. come to Miami, I'll, I'll let you please, know. Please, please let me know. Please let and me if, know. if the Texans get you, I'll be your number one fan. I'll yes. have your jersey. Them, tell, them, tell them they need their first female. I will be that. I will be water girl. <laughs> oh, no. Trust me. <laughs> You're, no, you'll do way more than that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And yeah, we'll be on the lookout and we'll be cheering you on. Thanks, Stephanie.